Murray once said, faithfulness to God is our first obligation in all that we're called to do in the service of the gospel. I think, I think Christians, for the most part, have a genuine desire to be faithful to God with the life he's given us, faithful to our calling and his command to make disciples and reach the lost, which means, of course, using everything at our disposal that he's given us to that end. I think most of us have a genuine desire to do that. But I also think because of the pressures that we face in life, uh, the reality of living in this world, the distractions of this world all around us, and the simple fact that we are by nature selfish creatures. I think there's also a tendency often to defer being faithful with what he's given us to tomorrow or the next day or the next. I think we spend probably more time thinking and talking about what we're going to do for God than we think about and talk about what we are doing for God. Because as long as what God wants us to do can be done tomorrow, well, then we can continue to focus on what we want to do today. The problem with that mindset is we aren't promised tomorrow. James, the brother of Jesus, said, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? If you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes, James 4.14. As followers of Christ, we've been called and commanded to make disciples, to reach the lost, to snatch lost souls from the fires of hell. We don't have the luxury of putting that off until tomorrow because none of us are promised tomorrow. The Apostle Paul said, We appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, In a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. God is calling us to be faithful, to leverage every resource and talent and ability that we have for the sake of his kingdom, not just tomorrow or next month or next year, but today. Because we all have a fixed amount of time on this earth and none of us knows when that time is up. And there are people all around us who are living and dying without Jesus. As Paul explains, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Romans 10, 13, and 14. You see, there's really no time to put off to tomorrow what he's called you to do today. Today's the day of salvation. Today is the day to do what he's created and called you to do. Look, today is the day for you to tell that person you've been thinking about witnessing to about Jesus today. Today's the day to make a commitment to that ministry you felt drawn to. Today is the day for you to let go of the unforgiveness you've been carrying around in your heart today. Today's the day to give the money, the time, the talent that God has given you to accomplish his purposes in your life. Today is the day. Today is the day to grow up into uh, every way into him who's the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. That's the key. We're the parts when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Today is the day to do your part to build up the church, to leverage every resource and talent and ability that you have for the sake of his kingdom. Today is the day to be faithful with what God has given you. By the way, uh, if you want to know what you might be able to accomplish in the future with whatever God is going to give you, just look at what you're accomplishing now with what he's already given you. That should paint a very clear picture for you because the fact is, if you're accomplishing much for Christ now with whatever he's given you to work with, then you will accomplish even more in the future as he continues to add more and more good things to your life. But listen, this part is also true. If you do very little for God with what you have now, you will do very little for God with what you have later. Jesus said, one who's faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then 
You have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth. That's the word mammon in the original language. It refers to money and possessions. If you're not faithful with your money and possessions, who, Jesus says, will entrust to you the true riches? Luke 16, 10 and 11. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, giving away what I have isn't much of a strategy for success, just remember, we've talked about it before, God didn't call you to be successful. God didn't call you to be successful. He called you to be faithful. Whether or not you're successful is up to Him. Whether or not you're faithful, well, that's entirely up to you. By the way, I'm not talking about um, not taking care of yourself or your family. Hear me. Jesus didn't say, love your neighbor instead of yourself. No, He said, love your neighbor as yourself. You're supposed to take good care of yourself and your family. Absolutely. The problem is that's where we tend to stop. And yet Jesus says, no, keep what you need to take care of yourself and your family. Then give the rest of it away that the needs of the body may be met and the kingdom may be advanced. Okay, when we started this church, we had 12 people and zero income. Five of those people were me and my wife and three kids. We didn't have everything we needed to start a church, not by a long shot, but we gave what we had anyway because that's what God called us to do. And as we've been faithful, he's given us more and more and more to work with. And I hope that never changes. But the truth is, when we started this church, we only had to get 12 people on board with God's plan. Really, it was only nine people because my three kids didn't have much say in the matter. Today, we have hundreds of people. And just so that you understand, throughout the past almost 12 years of pastoring this church at points all along the way. I've had to continually stop and ask myself the question, Rob, what are you going to do with what you've been given? I'm still asking myself that question, continually asking myself that question. And yet today, today I'm also asking you, what are you going to do with what you've been given? Because I believe the resources we need to do what God has called us to do, I believe they're in this house already. We just have to decide if we're going to be faithful in that or not. What are you going to do with what you've been given? It turns out Jesus had a lot to say on the subject. So let's open our Bibles as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the gospel according to Mark to chapter 4 of that book and see if we can answer that question. We'll pick up the story where we left off last week at verse 21, and we'll read through verse 25 to begin. Mark 4, 21 through 25. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away." So Jesus continues to teach the massive crowds of people from a boat just off the shore of the Sea of Galilee, as we saw last week earlier in the chapter, to literally keep from getting crushed by the people pressing in who are trying to get uh, close to him. And he begins this next parable by asking the question, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or a bed and not on a stand? There's one significant flaw, by the way. In many of the English translations of this verse, including the, the translation we're using here today, it says, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? The word a being an, uh, an indefinite article for those of you who are grammar nerds out there. The problem being when you read that question in the ancient Greek, Mark clearly uses a definite article before the word lamp, which means actually the correct way to read this question by Jesus is, is the lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand. The reason that's important is because Jesus isn't simply referring to just any lamp or just a lamp. No, he's referring to the lamp. He's referring to himself and the message he has brought with him, which lines up with the rest of Scripture, where the lamp is often used as a metaphor for God or the Messiah and his gospel. 2 Samuel 22, 29 2 Kings 8, 19, Psalm 132, 17, uh, Psalm 119, 105, John 1, 4 and 5, John 8, 12, that's to name a few. So Jesus says, listen up. This isn't just any message. This is the message. And I didn't bring it into the world to hide it. 
So pay attention to what you hear. He says, listen to what I'm telling you, because with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That was actually an ancient uh, Jewish proverb, by the way. It shows up in various forms in literature from that time period. Uh, In fact, one version that I read from another source says it this way. I'm quoting, in the pot in which you cook for others, you will be cooked. (laughs) The literal translation from the Greek, as Mark wrote it, says, in whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you and will be added to you. I also read it in at least two other versions in the Talmud, the, the central text of rabbinic Judaism. It's a very common saying. The point is, Jesus was using a very familiar saying that they all would have understood. And yet, instead of applying it to some common aspect of Hebrew culture, he's applying it directly to the gospel. Jesus was saying, you cannot hide what you've been given. In fact, if you conceal it long enough, what you have will be taken from you. Why? Because you cannot be trusted with it. Yet if you reveal it to the world, if you let this light of truth that you've been given shine through your life for all to see, even more will be given to you because you've proven yourself faithful with what you've been given. This is basically another version of the parable of the talents, if you're familiar with that story in Matthew 25, which ends with Jesus saying, for to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, Matthew 25, 29. Okay, the church, as I often tell you, is the harbinger of truth in this world. We have been entrusted with the gospel, the most profoundly life-transforming message in all of human history. Now, why do you think we've been given this truth? Is it just so that we can be saved? Because if that was the case, then Jesus' great commission to his disciples would have been, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and be saved. But that's not what he said, is it? No, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. We are the church, which means we cannot hide what we've been given. And yet I've had so many people who profess to be Christians over the years say to me, when I try to talk to them about Jesus, they'll say, well, pastor, my faith is a private matter. No, it isn't. There is nothing private about your faith in Christ. Nothing. Listen, Jesus didn't allow himself to be mocked, beaten, tortured, nailed to a Roman cross, and brutally murdered so that you could have a private faith. I'm sorry if sharing the gospel makes you uncomfortable. Too bad. If people can march down the streets of our cities today boldly celebrating every kind of sin imaginable, surely we can boldly proclaim the righteousness of Christ to our neighbor. We cannot hide what we've been given. Otherwise, Jesus said what we have will be taken away. So look, if you can't let your light shine in this highly religious Christian culture that we're living in, at least compared to other parts of the world, then what do you think is going to happen to your private faith the moment any real pressure is applied to Christians in this country? I'll tell you what will happen. Your private faith won't last two seconds. Because if you can't let the truth of the gospel shine through you when it's easy, you will never let the gospel shine through you when it's hard. This goes for every one of us. R.C. Sproul said, we are allowing God to be eclipsed by vignettes of pop psychology from the pulpit or by ministers communicating their private opinions on social and political issues of the day. It is the duty of the church in every generation of every pastor and of every Christian to take up that lamp, cast aside the basket and put the light in a prominent place where people can behold the truth of God and of his son. It's a big part of why we believe God called us to plant this church, to preach the whole counsel of God. That's why we preach and teach the way we do. It's why we go through entire books of the Bible the way that we do, because the gospel must be preached with compassion and love in its entirety, even when it makes us uncomfortable. And so this is one of the the core commitments of this church to this region that God planted us in, to make disciples, teaching them to observe all all that he commanded us, never hiding what we've been given. 
Let's keep reading verses 26 through 29. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So as Jesus continues to teach, he goes back to the idea of sowing seed. The same theme he talked about, we saw that last week in the first half of the chapter, except now instead of focusing on the soil, he focuses on the seed itself. And of course, uh, each one of us is called to sow the seed. We learned that last week, which is the gospel, which means our responsibility is to broadcast the seed, to spread the gospel. But notice what Jesus says about the seed after it's sown. The sower has nothing to do with whether or not the seed actually takes root in the soil. In other words, we are responsible for spreading the gospel, not seeing to it that people accept it, because we cannot make people accept it. And so whether or not the seed takes root in the soil, whether or not the gospel actually takes root in the uh, human heart, that, that part's beyond our control. Our part is simply to sow the seed and then patiently wait in faith that God will bring from it a harvest. Remember, you're not called to be successful. You're called to be faithful, right? There's a reason Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. He was faithful his entire life in ministry and didn't make one single convert. Was he successful? Not by any metric we use in this world, but he was surely faithful. You weren't called to be successful. You're called to be faithful. God's responsible for the success. You're responsible for being faithful with what you've been given, which means you just keep sowing seed. Listen, regardless of the outcome, you keep sowing seed because being faithful with what you have means you cannot keep what you've been given. The Apostle Paul said, whatever one sows, that will he also reap for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Galatians 6, 7 through 9. If we do not give up, what? Sowing seed. Making disciples. Doing good. So there's going to be a harvest from the seed that we sow, and yet we cannot determine the harvest. That part comes in due season, according to Paul. And that due season is determined by God alone when he decides the church has completed the task that he's assigned to us, which of course is to sow the seed. So even though the first century zealots, a Jewish faction who aspired to follow in the footsteps of the Maccabean freedom fighters who liberated Palestine from the Seleucid dynasty in the second century BC, Even though the first century zealots believed they could usher in the kingdom of God by staging a revolution against the Roman Empire. And even though the apocalyptic movement of the day said that the coming of the kingdom could be predicted by careful observation. And even though the Pharisees believed they could hasten the coming of the kingdom through strict legal observance. In the end, not one of those people could determine the end time harvest of souls for the sake of the kingdom of God. Listen, neither can we. If I had a dollar for every time somebody told me Jesus is coming back because this is lining up with that and whatever else. Hasn't happened yet. Do you remember 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988? Lord, help us. Our part in bringing about that harvest couldn't be more vital because there cannot be a harvest without the seed being sown. The harvest is up to him. So just to be sure you get this, from before the foundation of the world, before God created any of this, he created a plan for you and me and for everyone else. Right? His word says in your book were written every single one of the days that were made for me when as yet there were none of them. So a plan for our eternity. And the culmination of that plan is the return of Jesus Christ to harvest the souls of every human being who would ever receive the seed of his gospel that has been spread by the church. You understand, this is why you exist. This is why you're here, to sow that seed, to spread the gospel. 
Okay. It took me a long time to get this in my own life. You're not here to make a name for yourself. You're not here to build your own kingdom. You're not here to make your mark on this world. You're not here to get the most out of this life that you can. You were put here on this earth for one reason. To sow seed. That's it. And in order to help you do that, God has given you all of these resources, time, talent, money, material possessions, wisdom, understanding, relationships, ambition. He's given you all of these resources, not for you to build your kingdom, but for you to build his kingdom by spreading the gospel, sowing seed. I just want to make sure we get this today because every single good thing that you have, you have for one purpose, to help you sow more seed. Yet there are untold numbers of Christians attending churches every week who have gifts and talents and resources and ambition that they've been given by God, gifts meant to do good, to advance the kingdom of God, to make disciples, and yet instead of using all they've been given to sow the seed of the gospel, they keep it all to themselves. They hoard it all to themselves. It's like an apple tree not allowing anyone else to consume its apples because it wants to keep all of that beautiful fruit to itself. I mentioned this last week, right? The apples might make the tree look beautiful and feel good about itself, but if the tree thinks that is the sole purpose of the apples, then it has completely missed the point of why it has the privilege of producing apples to begin with. Right, because if you leave all those beautiful apples on the tree, what happens? The apples rot, and they don't benefit the tree or anyone else. It's just wasted fruit, because the apples are not produced for the consumption of the apple tree. The apples are produced for the consumption of others who are starving and need its fruit to be fed and to grow and to become healthy. Right? You understand, that's the only reason an apple, produces, an apple tree produces apples. The only reason an apple tree produces apples is to feed others. The reason you've been given good gifts, fruit in your life, is to give it away to feed others the gospel, to make disciples. And I'll just tell you that I believe with all my heart that a big part of why God has allowed this church to continue to grow the way it has is because of the seed we've sown. It's been nearly 12 solid years of pouring our lives into others. And what a privilege to be able to give away what we've been given. And I've watched so many of you doing that every day, day after day. What a privilege it is to sow seed into good soil and then stand back and watch God make it grow. But listen, the moment we stop sowing seed is the moment this church begins to die. We cannot keep what we've been given. Otherwise, all the beautiful fruit we produce begins to rot. So we give it away. And that's the way it has to be. If we want to keep growing and keep producing, we have to give away what he's given us and then watch him make it grow. J.I. Packer once said, faithfulness is our business. Fruitfulness is an issue that we must be content to leave with God. Let's finish our story for today, verses 30 through 34. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. The parable of the mustard seed is one of those teachings that was heavily uh, foundational in the early church, much like the parable of the sower and the soils from earlier in this chapter. Again, we talked about that. We see uh, this one evidenced as well uh, by the fact that it appears in all three of the synoptic gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So anytime th these parables or stories or sayings by Jesus are repeated through all of the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels and, and John, uh, 
you can count on that this was a foundational teaching for the early church. So we also find them in other uh, non-canonical or non-biblical writings. The Coptic Gospel of Thomas, which is not a part of the Bible again, but it still contains many of Jesus' teachings that are confirmed by the biblical gospel. So this was clearly a profoundly important parable, foundationally important, in fact, to the early church for a couple of reasons. First of all, when Jesus describes the mustard seed becoming a large tree or a, a shrub big enough for birds to nest in, he's alluding to the fact that the kingdom of God will include Gentiles as well as Jews, which of course was not only extremely controversial at the time, but foundational for the first century church. And yet, that is what he foreordained long before there even was a church. Numerous times, the Old Testament prophets used the image of birds nesting in the branches of trees to allude to the Gentiles being included in the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel 17, 23, uh, Daniel 4, 9 through 21 are just a couple of examples of that. So Jesus was saying, you cannot limit the church to the group of people you most identify with only. Like this isn't your little private club. And then secondly, he contrasts the amazingly small mustard seed with the fantastically large tree that it becomes. Jesus was saying you cannot limit the growth of the church because of its small beginnings. In other words, Jesus says you cannot limit what you've been given, either in scope or in size, despite your preconceived notions of who you think it should include or how big or small you think it should be. Look, when we started this church with just a handful of people, I honestly never in my wildest dreams thought we'd plant a campus at an addiction recovery facility. That was not in Rob's plans. I didn't know we would have an abortion recovery ministry. I didn't know most of the missionaries we'd send out would be going into the heart of Islam some of the spiritually darkest nations on earth. I didn't know we'd have so many different kinds of people from so many different kinds of backgrounds coming to this church, affiliating with this church, worshiping with us, being discipled together in a spirit of such tremendous unity. But we decided from the beginning we weren't going to limit who the church would minister to. And I'll tell you, uh, when we started at number two Church Street, over there where the kids are in that small building, Little did we know that two years in, we'd need to add a second service. I mean, I figured we'd have 30, 40 people forever. I was shocked when it grew the way that it did. And when we announced that we were gonna add a second service in that little building, there were some folks who weren't very happy about it because it would split up the congregation. But we committed to never limit the growth of this church either. It'll become whatever size God wants it to become. Okay, that part's up to him. We just have to be faithful to keep sowing seeds. So we added a second service at two years, and those of you who were there faithfully pressed on with us. Little did we know that a year later we'd outgrow two services and have an opportunity to buy this building and the one next door, and so we did. And there were some folks who were not happy about that because they loved our location in that little church building, but because we'd committed to never limit the scope or growth of this church, we moved and brought everyone back into one service together, and those of you who were there faithfully pressed on with us. Little did we know that six months after moving into this building, we'd outgrow one service and need to add another, and there were some folks who weren't so happy about that because we'd be splitting up the congregation but we did it anyway because we made a commitment to God never to limit the scope or growth of this church. And so we added that second service and those of you who were there faithfully pressed on with us, which brings us to today. Now listen, I don't know uh, what size this church is to become and I'm honestly not even a little bit concerned about that. Uh, if you look at trees in the forest, right? You have bonsai trees and apple trees, and redwood trees. You have trees of all different sizes. If a bonsai tree gets the size of a redwood tree, something's wrong. If a redwood tree never gets bigger than an apple tree, something's wrong. The, uh, what determines the health of a tree is not its size. It's whether or not it's still producing fruit. You understand? Bonsai trees produce seed, fruit. Apple trees produce fruit. Redwood trees produce fruit. 
Oak trees produce fruit, acorns, right? If an oak tree gets the size of a redwood tree, that's not a healthy tree. Something's wrong with that tree. Every tree has an optimal size. They don't grow forever. And the forest is full of healthy trees that are all different sizes that will never get any bigger than they are right now. So we don't look at size as the, the, the ultimate sign of health. We look at whether or not the tree is producing fruit. It's the same with the church. We need micro churches and medium churches and big churches and mega churches. That's right. Those, the sign of whether or not those churches are healthy is not their size. It's whether or not they're producing fruit. Okay, so whatever size this church is meant to be, that's up to God. I'm actually not the least bit worried about that. I just don't want to limit what we're doing because we don't have the vision for what God wants us to be doing. But whatever size it ends up, that's up to him. Our job is just to keep pressing forward, sowing seed. With that said, we're exceeding the limitations of all three of our buildings today. And we know there's much more God has called us to do. There are more people to be reached and more kinds of people to be reached. And yet we're rapidly running out of room. There are ministries that need to be expanded and many ministries that desperately need to be created, including, as I've talked about a lot, Christian education. Sunday school is my whole thing. It's my heart. You know, if you've come here, I talk about it constantly. I was saved in Sunday school. I was called to ministry in Sunday school. I was discipled in Sunday school. And I think it is uh, uh, one of the worst things that's happened to the modern church is that so many of us have dropped Sunday school out of our Sunday services. We become biblically illiterate largely in part because we no longer have Sunday school. I'm desperate for us to have multiple adult Sunday school and children's Sunday school classes offered on Sunday. We can't do one because we have no space. Our facilities won't allow for that growth. There are opportunities to invite our community, our city in, to host events that would allow us to reach people who would otherwise never darken the doors of a church. We've done a few ones that we can fit in here with incredible result. We cannot take full advantage of all the opportunities before us with the limitations of our current facilities. Uh, one part of the vision for this church has from day one for Mary Beth and I has been to have or at least to host a Christian theater to reach a broad audience of people who might be resistant to attending a Sunday morning service but would gladly attend a night at the theater. And the theatrical events we've uh, done here, uh, bringing in Academy of Arts and others, have had an incredible effect. We just don't have enough space to do any more. There's so much God has put in our hearts for this local church. And so today I'm simply asking you who are a part of it, what are you going to do with what you've been given? Because our natural tendency is, I think, to project our limitations onto God. But God is limitless. He's simply looking for willing vessels, people who are wholly submitted to his way, to his will, to his plan for you and everything that he's given you. I, I saw a quote that said, God has no larger field for the man who's not faithfully doing his work where he is. The moment we stop sowing seed is the moment this church begins to die. So what are you going to do with what you've been given? As most of you know, we've been exploring our options for new or expanded facilities for this church. At one point, we came to the conclusion that we just add on to these existing buildings. Uh, it's possible we don't have enough land for that. We've been back and forth with the commercial uh, GC. We're waiting on a final word from him probably at the end of this coming week. So we don't know for certain yet, and purchasing additional land here to give us more room, that door has been shut, so that's not an option. Uh, we've, we've pursued that with the landowners around us. Of course, we've tried adding a third service. Uh, that was not well enough attended to make a difference in our capacity in the two morning services, which leaves us to either add on to what we have, if possible, or to try and purchase or build something else. And yet every time a large enough building comes available in this little town, uh, large enough to accommodate this church and its future growth, we don't have the funds to move fast enough before someone else purchases it. And so through much prayer and counsel, uh, we believe it's time to begin a capital campaign uh, in order to raise the funds we need or at least enough to secure the funding necessary to make a purchase when the opportunity arises or again to add on to these facilities uh, if we're, we find out we can do that. Okay, uh, listen, I've never done this before. So 
We're going to walk through this together. We're probably, I'm being told, looking somewhere in the ballpark of uh, two and a half to three and a half million dollars uh, to add on to these facilities. If, of course, if we buy something else or build something, it's going to be more than that. Now, I will just tell you, if that sounds like a, a huge discouraging number between the funds that we have already raised, we, we took up some capital uh, campaign type offerings back in the beginning of COVID before everything shut down, trying to make a move then. With those funds that have come in, which have been put in a separate building fund and we haven't touched them, uh, and the, the equity that we have in these three buildings, we have quite a bit of equity in these buildings. If we were to liquidate all of this, sell everything, we would have just over a million dollars that we could have access to. Of course, that, that still leaves well over a million dollars or two that need to be raised at a minimum. If we, and that's if we sell these buildings, right? If we end up adding on to what we have, then we're starting with far less funds available to us unless we borrow against the equity in these buildings, which we don't want to do. So to address all of this, we're forming a building and expansion team to help us navigate our way through it. And very soon, we're going to be presenting you with a much more specific plan for raising the needed funds and moving all of this forward. For now, what I'm asking for you to do is simply to pray and begin to ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do with what I've been given? Let's pray.